Okay, so we're starting module four, which is the module on cultural relativism. And so we spent um, a lot of time in the first several modules talking about the universality of human rights, about universal human rights, where rights are uh, based upon your humanity, so it doesn't matter basically where you live <clears throat> or where you're from, that if you are a human, these rights cannot be taken away from you. Um, to kind of sum that up. So now I want to introduce this concept of cultural relativism about whether or not different cultures can interpret different meanings when it comes to human rights. So it might be that certain practices in some areas of the world um, might be deemed um, a human rights violation in other areas of the world. So this is the, the concept of cultural relativism. So what do we mean by cultural relativism? And I'm going to go back to the, the scholar Jack Donnelly to talk a little bit about what we mean by cultural relativism. But kind of think of the idea that there are some variations that cannot be legitimately criticized by outsiders. So this idea that whatever is done in a specific society or a specific country, that those practice shouldn't be or cannot be um, judged by those outside of that society. Most human rights scholars, uh, including Jack Donnelly, will allow for some cultural relativist interpretation, but not a whole lot. So Jack Donnelly argues that culture possesses only a modest challenge to the contemporary normative universality of human rights. And that's a direct quote from Donnelly in one of his writings. Okay. So he goes on to say, when internal and external judgments of a practice diverge, that means when what happens inside a country and outside a country, when, they, when the judgments of what those practices are differ, cultural relativists give priority to the internal judgments of a society. Okay, so keep that in mind when we're thinking about cultural relativism. So, relativism. Basically, this is the idea that moral values are culturally specific and that there is no international standards, so to speak, when it comes to certain practices. And when other countries impose um, practices on other countries, this is considered a form of cultural imperialism. Okay? And here's just a um, uh, kind of this cultural imperialism, if you will, if you remember the Marlboro Man. Um, this was a popular cartoon, not cartoon, but advertisement when I was younger of the Marlboro Man was kind of the cowboy from the West. Well, this has then been um, kind of put into this particular context of pop culture and how it's transported around the world. All right, this is very different from a universal perspective where universalism holds that there are certain rights like the right to life that cannot be violated on moral grounds. And this, these rights are derived from sources outside of society. So if we go back to module one where we talked about where do human rights, where do we get these ideas, and we think about um, natural law, um, where we derive the sources of human rights, that those kinds of natural law rights are not culturally specific. But of course, you run into this issue of sovereignty again, about can one state impose a, a definition of human rights on another state. So states ultimately have the authority to manage internal affairs. But we talked last time in Module 3 about whether or not states can intervene on human, uh, for humanitarian purposes. And so there is this issue of sovereignty when it comes to the debate between universalism and cultural relativism. All right, so Jack Donnelly offers up this spectrum of cultural relativism and universalism. And for many, the strong cultural relativist position is an obstacle to implementing human rights law. So kind of think of this spectrum. And you might see this again. So you're going to want to be able to explain these different positions. All right. Jack Donnelly um, suggests that in its most extreme form, and I'm quoting him here, he says, what we can call radical cultural relativism holds that culture is the sole source of the validity of a moral right or rule. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum where you have radical universalism, he says, 
This would hold that culture is irrelevant to the universal validity of moral rights and rules. So you have these continuums that are defined by these two endpoints, and then you can divide it into a strong cultural relativism and a weak cultural relativism position. So a strong cultural relativism position holds that culture is the principal source of the validity of rights. And at its, further ex at its furthest extreme, strong cultural relativism accepts a few basic rights with virtually universal application, but allows such a wide range of variation that two entirely justifiable sets of rights might overlap only slightly. Then he goes on to say that weak cultural relativism, which might also be called strong universalism, considers culture a secondary source of the validity of the right. Universality is initially presumed, but the relativity of human nature, communities, and rules checks potential excesses of universalism. At its furthest extreme, weak cultural relativism, or strong universalism, recognizes a comprehensive set of prima facie universal human rights, but allows for limited local variations. And these variations are based on the substance of the list of human rights, the interpretation of certain rights, and the form in which these rights are going to be implemented. And he tends to argue for a strong universalist or what is called a weak cultural uh, relativist position that permits deviations from international human rights norms primarily at the f level of interpretation. So for Donnelly, this is the position that he is going to take, okay? He's going to take this position, um, oh, sorry, the weak cultural relativist position when it comes to um, dealing with human rights. So this position right there, okay? And so radical cultural relativists way over there on the left think that culture is the defining um, or the, the, the definition of a human right is culturally based versus a radical universalism who doesn't allow for any cultural interpretation. So there's a spectrum of interpretation when it comes to human rights. Okay. All right. Donnelly goes on to argue um, goes, goes further to argue that and again, this is picking up to what I was talking about in Module 1, that non-Western culture and political traditions like the pre-modern West lack not only the practice of human rights, but also the very concept. And so when people start to make a cultural, cultural relativist argument, they tend to focus more on duties rather than rights. And he makes this argument that this is a structural problem that is common to all the pre-modern West as well as non-Western culture, and it's not particularly a cultural argument. And so he goes through and talks about Islam, the pre-modern West, Africa, China, uh, the caste system of India, and talk about how these um, practices are more related to duties than rights. And in fact, what he says is that there's a whole list of explanations for why there is a persistence of cultural relativist arguments in today's world. And so he goes on to uh, argue that it's uh, surprisingly common for, um, for otherwise sophisticated individuals to take the particular institutions associated with the realization of a right in their country or culture to be essential to that right. So it's very common for each society to believe that um, the way that they do things in so their society is the right way. Um, so we all tend to have this very ethnocentric view of what is right and wrong and that our way is the right way. Secondly, he suggests that some very narrow-minded and um, uh, very uh, streamlined positions tends to exacerbate certain confusions between universality and cultural relativism. And he gives an example about an uh, American teenager, and this happened uh, several, many years ago. He vandalized um, some private property in Singapore that was worth thousands of dollars. And he was sentenced to be publicly caned. 
And this, of course, um, upset many in the United States who believe this is a human rights violation to go out and cane people. And President Clinton was president at the time, and he argued with apparently genuine indignation that it was in, uh, abominable to cane someone, but he failed to find it even notable that in his own country people are being fried in the electric chair. So again, our concept of what is um, considered a human rights violation um, isn't considered a human rights violation in Singapore. Okay, so what do we mean by um, uh, inhumane treatment, for example, for a crime? Is caning in, any more inhumane than the electric chair? So again, we tend to have all societies, all cultures tends to have this very ethnocentric view about what right and wrong is. Another reason why cultural relativist arguments persist in today's society is because of the legacy of colonialism. And so this is the uh, popular explanation for relativist, uh, relativist arguments in Africa and Asian and Muslim societies because they are making an argument that their experience under the colonial um, uh, their, their colonial masters led them to have a very different view of what human rights are. Um, another argument for why uh, cultural relativist positions persist is because these different societies want to express and foster their own natural, national, cultural, regional, civilization pride, as Donnelly suggests. And then he makes an argument that perhaps the most important explanation, he says, is that they're used by the elites as a way to attempt to deflect attention from their repressive policies. And this is the one that I really want to highlight again, that cultural relativist arguments tend to persist because elites, leaders, many times dictators in other countries, attempt to deflect attention from their repressive policies. And so, I'm going to give you one such example, um, and it uh, relates to an uh, article in your reader about Asian values. Okay. So remember, the predominant view of human rights in the Western world is based on liberalism, which asserts that individuals have certain rights which the state cannot infringe upon. Okay. Asian leaders have often challenged this Western conception of human rights. Um, asserting what are called Asian values as a challenge to this predominant ideology. Asian values challenge the Western notion that human rights are individual in nature. Indeed, the West conceives of human rights as rights individuals are endowed with regardless of the state they reside in, i.e. universal. Okay. Asian values, by contrast, suggest that group rights trump those of the individual. So proponents of Asian values argue that their culture emphasizes the rights of groups and that Western concept of human rights, which stress the rights of individuals, amounts to cultural imperialism. So Lee Kuan Yew, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, and Dr. Mohammed from Malaysia, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, as well as uh, the former President of China, uh, have been at the forefront in claiming Asia's unique cultural traditions supersede the primacy put on personal freedoms championed in the West. And this was all outlined in what is called the Bangkok Declaration of 1993, which was signed by many East and Southeast Asian nations. And it stakes out, quote, a distinctive Asian point of view when it comes to human rights. Lee Kuan Yew sums up the essence of Asian values uh, the following way. And so this, this is a quote. Okay. He says, we have a different culture, a different way of doing things. The individual is not the building block. It's the family, the extended family, the clan, and the state. The five crucial relationships are you and the prince or ruler, you and your wife, you and your children, you and your parents, you and your friends. If these relationships are right, everything will work out well in society. Okay. So the Bangkok Declaration um, kind of sets out the, 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 the view and suggests that states and presumably the communities within states should be able to suspend rights of the individual for the good of the group. 
This translates into less importance on security rights and political rights with greater emphasis on economic growth in general and theoretically the subsequent subsistence rights. This position was pr uh, particularly prominent during the height of the Asian quote economic miracle in the 1990s. Proponents of Asian values argue that the realization of individual human rights should be put on hold in order for these countries to realize a degree of economic success. So there's really kind of a trade-off, if you will. The leaders of many Asian countries arguing from an Asian values perspective that we're going to suspend individual rights in the short term in exchange for economic success in the long term. Okay. In 1992, Lee Kuan Yew remarked that, quote, I do not believe that democracy necessarily leads to development. I believe that what a country needs to develop is discipline more than democracy. The exuberance of democracy leads to indiscipline and disorderly conduct which are inimical to development, end quote. And this was in The Economist in 1994. And so the theories of modernity that the West went through and strongly tried to emphasize to non-Western countries was that you needed to have democracy for development. And the Asian values argument rejects that position. So from their perspective, Asian leaders stress the sovereignty of the state, as I mentioned before, as is preeminent in its ability to realize economic growth. Other values, such as the right to criticize one's government or the right not to be tortured or detained, may interfere with the state's ability to maintain order and thereby encourage economic growth. So the good of the collective or community, the primacy of the family, and an emphasis on order and authority were all cited as the Asian values that contributed to the economic success in the region, particularly Southeast Asia. Thus, the Asian values debate is generally focused on economic gains for the state as a whole, which would then presumably um, improve the quality of life for the state's citizens. From this perspective, the suspension of political rights and security rights in the short term is justified to encourage economic growth in the long term for the good of the state as a whole, and that would then trickle down to the good of the individual uh, uh, citizen. Now. The critique of, uh, that they're offering, um, the Asian value perspective, is a critique on the excesses of capitalism, the critique on the liberal emphasis on the individual, okay? and that this, this emphasis on the individual serves as a detriment to society, that the liberal emphasis leads to selfishness and a decline in morality and leads to um, the um, downfall, if you will, of orderly society. And so um, the Asian values argument is much more in line with the idea that order requires a strong central government, very much of a leviathan, if you will. Additional critique is that the West uh, attempts to impose its values on the rest of the world, a sort of Western cultural imperialism again, and at the heart of their argument is that of cultural relativism. Okay? And so in the, um, in the article in the text that you're to read on, um, in, the, in the, uh, the, the, the selection on the rhetoric of Asian values, um, Tommy Koh, who is uh, uh, one of the leaders of, of, of uh, uh, prominent uh, proponent of Asian values, provides these 10 elements as crucial components of Asian values. So on page 115, East Asians do not believe in the extreme form of individualism practiced in the West. East Asians believe in strong families. Asian, East Asians revere education. East Asians believe in the virtues of saving and frugality. East Asians considered hard work a virtue, the chief reason this region, the, the chief reason that this region is outcompeting Europe. East Asians practice national teamwork. There's an Asian version of a social contract between the people and the state. The government will maintain law and order and provide citizens with the basic needs of jobs, housing, education, and health care. In some Asian countries, governments have sought to make every citizen a stakeholder in their country. So more than 90% of Singaporeans, for example, own their own homes. 
East Asians want the governments to maintain a, mor a morally wholesome government in which to bring up their children. And good governments in East Asia want a free press, but unlike the West, they do not believe that such freedom is an absolute right. Okay. So, if we think about the Asian values, community takes precedent. There is a social and economic rights that trump civil and political rights. Okay. So there is this trade-off argument when it comes to human rights and development. Okay. But beyond the rhetoric lies the reality that the continent of Asia is not immune to the travesties of human rights abuse. In fact, the citizens in the countries of Asia have endured similar gross human rights violations as their counterparts in Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. History reveals episodes of genocide and Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia, the tyranny of Kim, Young, Kim, El, Kim Il Sung and now Kim Jong Tu of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and now, of course, his son, and the dictatorship of Fernando Marcos in the Philippines. You have a variety of armed conflicts have plagued the region ranging from wars of independence, civil wars, ethnic conflict to uh, d border disputes. You have the problems of child soldiers and child labor have not escaped the region. Human trafficking of women and children is prevalent. And even in Japan, where many non-Japanese women find themselves ex employed in the sex industry. So in spite of the Asian values rhetoric criticizing the excesses of liberalism and the wantonness of individualism in the West, many of the worst human rights violations have occurred in this region. So while there might have been significant gains in the area of economic development, a large percentage of the population, particularly the poor and young, remain at risk. And so if we look at a Freedom House, and this is a few years old, but it, uh, we can go back and look at it today. Uh, if we look at Freedom House, and we talked about what Freedom House was when we talked about measurement, these countries are considered to be free when it comes to political and civil rights. These countries are considered to be partly free, and these countries in Asia are considered to be not free. Okay, um, and so if we look at um, the Asian values even further, we can look at a measurement that's that's looking at economic inequality. And so the argument suggests that if we're going to focus in on economic rights and forego uh, political and civil rights, that we should have less economic inequality in our countries, right, if you're, if you're the Asian values argument. The Gini coefficient is a measure of economic equality. So the higher the value, the more economic inequality exists. So those leaders who are advocating the Asian values arguments are the leaders of Malaysia, China, Singapore, and these countries have the largest levels of um, inequality in their state, whereas over here in Japan has a fairly lower level of economic inequality. Okay, so we're seeing this Asian value argument is not coming to fruition when it deals with the issues of economic development. So the countries at large might be gaining in terms of total GDP, like China, for example, with the largest GDP but it's not going to do anything about the level of inequality that the Asian values arguments promise. Okay, So again, just to kind of look at what we're talking about, these are the countries involved in the Asian value argument um, when you look at a map. Well, their position of the Asian value is juxtaposed to that of human rights act activists, dissidents within the region, and certain religious leaders such as the Dalai Lama. And so the Dalai Lama offers a critique of the Asian values in a speech um, that he gave uh, the United Nations World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna, Austria in 1993. He clearly argues from a universal position, contending that regardless of country, nationality, or ethnicity, quote, we are basically the same human beings. Okay, this is very similar to the Donnelly argument. He rejects the prospect of Asian values, suggesting that, in fact, most Asians fail to adhere to the idea as well. So he, can, he says here, the question of human rights is so fundamentally important that there should be no difference of views on this. We must therefore insist upon a global consensus, not only on the need to respect human rights worldwide, but more importantly on the definition of these rights. And this is where there's that problem of what do we mean by universal human rights.
And he says, recently some Asian governments have contended that the standards of human rights laid down in the UDHR are those advocated by the West and cannot be applied to Asia and other parts of the third world because of differences in culture and differences in economic and social development. So again, he's saying that this cultural relativist argument doesn't apply. He says, I do not share this view. And I'm convinced that the majority of Asian people do not support this view either, for it is the inherent nature of all human beings to yearn for freedom. So it's inherent in each of us to yearn for freedom of the individual. Okay, so if we want to list this critique of the Asian values, it's rejected by dissidents, activists, and scholars alike. Okay. Many scholars and observers make the similar claims to the Dalai Lama, particularly that the region of Asia is so vast to gain any consensus on such a topic. Go back to that map and look at the size and diversity of Asia. Okay? In addition, critics of the Asian value argument suggest that the emphasis on family, collective, or community doesn't equate to blind devotion to the state. And adopting the Asian value perspective inherently assumes that citizens must choose between rights when most evidence suggests that rights are achieved somewhat simultaneously. Okay? And so the, there is no monopoly on the emphasis on family from an, from an Asian perspective versus a non-Asian perspective. And this goes back to what Donnelly suggested is the reason for the persistence of cultural relativism as an argument and that it's used to justify state repression. All right, so that's one example of a cultural relativist position. And so you should kind of go back over Asian values and make sure you understand what is being argued in the reading 4.2 on the rhetoric of Asian values. All right, we will take a break here and then um, lecture 4.2 will talk a little bit more about some different perspectives, particularly Islamic views and um, African values when it comes to human rights.